Okay, I'm going to make this fast because this is the latest talk I've ever given. Might be the latest talk I've ever been to, so I'm going to move along pretty quickly here. Um, so why do we love trees? We all love trees, obviously. Why do we love trees? This is a, um, a survey I got from the Arbor Day Foundation asked to pick the thing, the one most important thing about trees and you had a choice of they're, they're a source of shade, or they provide oxygen, that they are a source of beauty, that they sequester carbon from the atmosphere, they clean the air and water, they are a habitat for other animals and species. So which one of those is the most important? <laughs> That's right, they're all important, you can't pick one. So we've been talking a lot about individual trees and now I'm going to talk about the big picture a little bit. A, the world's forests, a reminder that not everywhere on the planet is forested. We are very lucky we happen to live on a forested part of the planet. The Right now, 30% of the land mass is have, is forested on planet Earth, and that is down from 46%. So 46% to 30%. We are losing forests. When was the 46%? When was the 46%? That was, um, thank you, that's a very good question. That's estimates from prehistory. Okay. Um, so, Right now, 10 countries have no forest at all. 64 countries have less than 10% of their land mass covered with forest. And the five nations with the most forest on the planet, well, they are also large. Oh, hello. Um, there are five countries with the most forest are Brazil, China, Russia, Canada, and US. So what we do really matters, because we're one of the most forested countries on the planet. But we are losing forests, as I said. And the, that, those statistics, if anybody's interested, are collected every five years from the United Nations. You look up the FAO organization, Food Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. They do a pretty good job of looking at global forest cover. I'm going to talk about. Um, Okay, so we're losing forest cover, we call that deforestation, and most of the deforestation is conversion to agriculture. We're talking about conversion to a use that probably won't go back. We were talking about Ohio today, and Ohio used to be almost entirely covered with forest, and now there's not much forest left in Ohio. So I was not surprised to hear that there's no Ohio Buckeyes. <laughs> They've cut them all down. Um, Ireland, we think of it as this green, flat landscape it used to be forested. Those forests have been removed. So much grazing pressure, those forests are probably not going to come back and forest it. Um, same with other countries. You think of Italy, Iraq. These places used to be forested. Now they're not. Brazil, a lot of it currently being deforested, converted to agriculture. And then urban, here's Baltimore. That is probably not going to go back to forest either. So that is deforestation. So there's the um, um, total amount of forest. And Maryland, where I live, was 90% covered with forest, and now 44% covered with forest. The county I live in, Wicomico County, estimated to look like this in 1620. We didn't have any satellite imagery then. And 1994 looked like this. And most of that was pine plantation <coughs> for very young forests. So the forest that remains here was not old growth. So there's quantity globally. We're losing forests, but then there's quality that I want to talk about too. Because we look at this, this is not deforestation. In fact, by um, definition, this is considered still a forest because this is going to go back into forest. Um, this is the state forest near me. And Earlier, someone was mentioning the, um, the white oaks in West Virginia. I think it was Yale. There, there's a picture of what some of the white oaks used to look like in West Virginia. 
Are we ever going to have white oaks again like that? I don't know. Is this place ever going to be a mixed native forest that it was with a lot of big white oaks and red oaks and tulip trees and understory species that we tend to skip over like hollies and dogwoods? Or will this be a pine plantation? Probably a pine plantation. But this is not considered deforestation, but it is still loss of quality in my mind. It'll probably end up with something like that. So when we talk about the quality of the forest that's left, of that 30% that's left, 36% is considered primary forest still. And most of that would be places like Brazil and, and Russia and Canada. But we're also losing primary forest because it's being cut and converted. And in, from 2000 to 2010, we lost 100 million acres of primary forest. Now some of that, as I just showed you, grew back and was into forest as plantation. Some of it was completely lost, but we're losing primary forest as well. So going down to the globe, looking at U.S., where were the forests in the U.S.? The Great Eastern Forest, where we are now, many different types, and then the more scattered Western forest, no forest here in the plains, of course, because it's too dry and we don't have forest cover there. Dry and, and the frosts and fires, lots of reasons. And a lot of you have seen these graphs before. This is a series of three graphs made in 1925 by U.S. Forest Service. So this is not just some modern day environmentalist making these. So estimated area of virgin forest in 1620. There would have been among this um, clearings for food plots for Native Americans, places where tornadoes had been through, places where there had been forest fires. But in between those places, the majority of it was mature woodland. And concurrent with European settlement in this country, then the woods started to be looked at as a crop and started to be cut for export as well as domestic use and with the development of urbanization, you all know the story, the, you know, the railroad ties, the, um, the iron mills, the everything, you know, you name it. And the forest was already cut forest by then. By 1920, the area of virgin forest, we don't even use that term anymore. It's considered a patriarchal term. We call it old growth or primary now. Um, by 1920, that was way down, and we don't have a more uh, up-to-date graph, but that amount of old growth would be even less. Because from 1920 to now, You've heard the stories, you read about some of them in my book, the forests, a lot of them lost in the 1940s using the Second World War as an excuse. So uh, removal of old growth forests has continued from then until now. And the estimates now are that there is less than 1% of our original forest left in the east and 5% left in the west. Okay. So this is all pretty depressing, right? You know, the deforestation and the loss of primary forests and what we've done in our country. And, um, you know, the, the pictures you see of the trees, will we ever see trees that size again? You know, we're talking about the biggest of these wonderful trees that we're measuring and looking at, but, you know, there were probably bigger ones that are gone, carried away before they were ever measured. And even on a, on a daily basis right now today, I see this still going on. So this is the forest across the road from me. This is owned by the county. It's a young forest. It's about eight years old. The biggest thing in there are loblolly pines, but it's a mixed native forest. It came back naturally. There's a lot of diversity in there. If that forest were left alone, 
someday that could be an old growth forest. This is what Dale and I are talking about. Can they ever, you know, heal? Can you ever get old growth again? And yes, I believe, you know, you can give it enough time. Enough time. How much is that? Well, it depends on where you are. Um, this forest, maybe it needs another 250 years, and it'll be one of these remarkable old growth forests again. <coughs> And in California, you're going to need maybe a thousand years for that. But are we leaving any of this that's already been cleared alone to heal to become old growth again? No. What I say. What you know? So this is again a state forest, Maryland State Forest, and you know they think this is great. And now this area is going to be sprayed with herbicide to prevent anything from growing back except the pine trees that they want there. So we're going from mixed native forest starting to heal, 80 years old, to starting over to a pine plantation that, when this is cut in 40 years, is going to be another plant, pine plantation and another one. So um, you see the damage, and then you can say, oh, that's too bad that they did that. But then you have to ask, well, what are we doing to heal it? Are we doing anything to heal it? And those are the questions I started asking myself. Um, why do we want to heal it? Not just for ourselves, but for the wildlife. 95, this is E.O. Wilson, I just got to hear him at Penn State the other night. 95% of species diversity is lost when an older forest is converted to a pine plantation. So a lot of these species we look at that are rare, Reptiles, amphibians, birds, mammals, a lot of it is because they've lost their habitat. And the science goes on. Don't try to read these all, but many birds benefit from the old growth forests. You all know this, the reptiles, amphibians, salamanders, turtles. And this is the type of relationships I was talking about in my first book. And in that book, I visited an old growth forest. And I kept getting the same question over and over again. People wanted to know, where is that old growth forest? How do I get to that old growth forest? And so I knew that there was a hunger for people that wanted to see these places. And they can be difficult to find if there's less than 1% left in the east. And so I decided I would visit these forests that are left, this 1%, and let people know where they were, give them directions share exactly what I found there. And that was my journey from 19, no, 2006 to 2008, visiting one old growth forest in each of the 26 eastern states and giving directions. This is Bob's forest. <laughs> <laughs> and like that. Are those lights too bright? Should we turn off them? No, go ahead and turn that off. I don't know. Well, we're, we're not going to be that much longer. Okay, so these are just a few pictures from the places I've, I visited for that book. Swallow Falls, I heard somebody talking about Swallow Falls here. This and this. Here we are, Cook Forest. It's in my book. It's one of my favorites. I'm so happy to be able to come back here. This is beautiful as ever. And in the book, I, it, it was one of my top four out of all the 26 that I visited and said that I long to come back, so this is a wonderful excuse to come back. Thank you, Dale. And uh, Congaree, South Carolina, another one of my favorites. Amazing. Raise your hand if you've been there. Okay, yay. And Sipsy Wilderness in Alabama was just amazing. You know, like here, true old growth, lots of it. Hundreds and hundreds of acres. Amazing place. Pioneer Mother, small, but Beautiful. So, I'm a scientist. I went on this journey to look at all these old growth forests. I thought, what am I going to discover? I thought I would discover some new pattern in nature or something that I could write about because the first rule of scientific, ob scientific discovery is ob observation. But what I observed was these places are so beautiful. So beautiful. So what do I do with that as a scientist? Can we quantify that? That's what I say as a scientist. So I actually came back and designed a study um, measuring. <laughs> you laugh, but this 334 students participated in 
in this study, it is highly significant that the mature forest is more beautiful than the young forest. And uh, this forest was only about 60 years old. This forest was only 15 years old. I really wanted to have an old growth forest here, but there was no old growth forest nearby that I could get the students to. So my, my vision was the grass that would go like that. So maybe something. John, did you flunk all those that voted on the <laughs> <laughs> um, So um, this was actually published in the International Journal of Environmental Studies, and the title is Measuring the Beauty of the Forest. And um, last night I was, I was, I left this space because I was going to put the reference there, but I didn't get around to it last night. So. I discovered how beautiful the forests are, and I discovered how rare they are. As you drive hundreds of miles to get to the next little piece of old growth, you realize. It becomes very uh, visceral to you. So I started thinking, what can we do? Because if we don't reverse it, then we're part of the problem. We can't just blame the people that were 100 years ago. It's now our turn to reverse it. What can we do? So I was thinking geographically because I was visiting, you know, one forest in each state. So I started thinking, hmm, one forest in each state is hard for the children in that state to get to because even if it's one in each state, it's a long way from, let's say, here to there. But what if there was one forest in each county that was not cut? that could develop in old growth characteristics. We're not going to find old growth in every county, but all these, the counties where forests can grow anyway, can we identify a forest and then say we're going to protect this forest so it can regain old growth characteristics, future old growth forests? So there's <coughs> 2,140 counties in the U.S. 2,370 of them can support forests, and so that's, that's the idea that was born, the Old Growth Forest Network. One forest in each county, protected from logging, open to the public. Why do we want to do this? Besides the fact, you know, that they produce oxygen and sequester carbon dioxide and, <coughs> and all those other reasons. We also want to do it for the next generation so they can see what the surface of their planet is supposed to look like or could look like or used to look like. And also we want to do it because if they don't understand and have a relationship with the natural world, then when our generation is gone, there's not going to be anybody here to fight for it and to try to protect it. So. We need to protect it so that children can develop a relationship with it. And if they develop a relationship with it and protect it, then it's going to help the other organisms on the planet, too. So it's a, a feedback thing. Benefits everybody. Um, and if you've read Richard Love's books, Last Child in the Woods, you know about nature deficit disorder. So the Old Growth Forest Network will be a place where the next generation can connect with the forest. So. That's what the dream is. So each of these forests will need a couple of parking spaces and a little trail so families can go there. So how do I do this? How, how do we do this? Well, the easiest way to do it is to start to find out where the old forests are already. That's kind of the low magnitude fruit. And say, OK, here, here's a good one, here's a good one, here's a good one. We are going to put that in the Old Forest Network. So I use Pennsylvania because I'm here today, and Pennsylvania, the state of Pennsylvania, great, they have this great website where they show you the old growth forest, they, they have an auto tour, they give you directions to it, and here we are right here. Overlapping two counties. And actually three counties. And this is, I was just here in Penn State. Um, a few days ago, and they all have they have the Alan Seeger forest near there. And as uh, Dale was talking about these areas, I was 
curiously writing things down about other counties that have old growth. So these would be the logical places to start where the old growth is already and is already open to the public and identify that as part of the network. But look, there's a lot of counties here with no old growth. And what do we do with those? So just as an example, I just, I don't know anything about Berks County, really. I just picked it out because of the shape. I said, OK, think, what about this county? You know, throw a dart there, Berks County. Where would we start with Berks County? So one thing you can do is get maps of the protected areas. And when you, kind of, when you first look at a county and you see the protected areas, you think, oh, there's, you know, there's a lot of stuff there. That's not too bad. But there's a problem with this term protected area. Most pe if people don't understand, they think, oh, it's natural areas, natural protected areas, but it's not. Most of these protected areas are agricultural lands, and they're considered protected because they're going to stay in agriculture. So farmers have easements on them to stay in agriculture. Or they are private. Some of them could be very nice forests, but they're private forests that easements have been put on. So this, they're not going to be good for the network because they are not open to the public. So just because something's protected doesn't mean it's natural and doesn't mean it's open to the public. So then you think, what about parks? So looking at the parks, um, so these are the <coughs> probably urban parks right there in Redding. But what about these other parks? Do they have any good native forests there? Well. Really, who knows? And it's the same thing for the average citizen. How would they know which park has the best forest there, or mature forest, if they want to connect with the forest and walk through the forest? So we're doing kind of a little bit of homework for them. Some of the parks are just golf courses. Some of them are reservoirs and really don't have any forests. But there could be a park here that has a nice mature forest, and that might be appropriate for the network. If not, if none of them have a decent forest, well, then we, we might go down the list then, and sometimes the Audubon societies might own a nice forest, or sometimes Nature Conservancy. And there's all kinds of different ownership levels. In Massachusetts, um, one of the forests that's going to be in the network is in, owned by the trustees of reservations. They buy and protect historic homes. And this historic home just happened to come with this beautiful old growth forest. And it's open to the public, and it has a trail and a couple of parking areas. It's going to be perfect for the network. So that is the Old Growth Forest Network. And um, I just retired from my teaching job last year to get it started. I've been working on it for the last 11 months. We're coming along great. We have our nonprofit status file. We, um, I have a wonderful board that's gotten together. We have a website I'll show you in a second. Um, getting ready to send out our first newsletter. I hope you'll fill out the supporter cards. But one question you may have in your mind is, um, why do we want to, besides the fact that this will be a network of all these places, it's like if a place is, is already protected, why does it matter if we put it in the network? And the way I look at that is it's an, it's an extra layer of protection in a way. You know, if you say something's in the old growth forest network and people care about that and there's some question about what's going to happen with that forest in the future, I'm hoping that that will be just one more reason to protect that forest and save that forest. And even in the process of identifying these forests in certain places, we find that all the pieces are there except, whoops, it's not really legally protected from logging. People say, oh, we're not planning to log, or we assumed it was protected, but when you get right down there, you find out it's not. So sometimes we're able to help make that next step and get that protected from logging to get it into the network. So I could be a supporter, visit our website, and that is the end of my talk. I'll try to keep it short.
the, in the Forest Cathedral, where you were today, um, tomorrow morning at 8.30. Dale and I are going to go out there and hang up the sign. And at 8.45, we're going to have a little photo op and um, celebration. And you're all welcome to join if you want to. We're supposed to be down there at 9 o'clock at the Environmental Education Center. It's right outside there. So if you want to come 15 minutes early and be part of it, you're welcome to. And so we're, we're going to um, recognize this forest as being the very first one in the network. And then the second will also be in Cook Forest and it will be in the um, next county over, which is Forest County, and there's a beautiful old growth trail that goes through there, Cook Trail, and that would be number two. And also on the supporter cards, um, if you have any ideas for particular nice forests and counties that you know of, let me know. That's all we got. So, there we go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.